read together Lord's Day 32. Lord's Day 32 begins the third and final part of the Heidelberg Catechism, dealing with thankfulness. Since then we are delivered from our misery, merely of grace, through Christ, without any merit of ours, why must we still do good works? Because Christ, having redeemed and delivered us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit after his own image, that so we may testify by the whole of our conduct, our gratitude to God for his blessings, and that he may be praised by us. Also, that everyone may be assured in himself of his faith by the fruits thereof, that by our godly conversation, others may be gained to Christ. Cannot they then be saved who, continuing in their wicked and ungrateful lives, are not converted to God? By no means. For the Holy Scripture declares that no unchaste person, idolater, adulterer, thief, covetous man, drunkard, slanderer, robber, or any such like, shall inherit the kingdom of God. <coughs> the book of Titus, beloved, is that New Testament epistle which has most to say on the subject of good works is the topic of Lord's Day 32. You could even structure this epistle around the theme of good works. You could say that Titus chapter 1 deals with good works and the church institute. That Titus 2 deals with good works and the family. Titus chapter 3, good works with respect to the world around us. If you look with me at this book of Titus, after the greeting in Titus 1 verses 1 through 4, verses 5 through 9 deal with the qualifications of elders, which is closely related to the good works of elders. The next section, verses 10 through 16, describes the evil works of false teachers who are, as verse 16 puts it, unto every good work reprobate, rejected, disqualified. And of course those who follow such false teachers are the blind following the blind, and they make up the false church. Moving to Titus chapter 2, the first 10 verses speak of the good works of aged men and aged women, young women and young men, and then servants or slaves or employees. The remainder of that chapter Verses 11 through 15 tells us that these good works spring from the grace of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, speak especially of the good works of obeying civil magistrates. That short phrase, good works, occurs even in this short epistle some six times more frequent here than anywhere else in the Bible Titus is the epistle of good works I quoted it before Titus 1 verse 16 says that these false teachers are unto every good work reprobate chapter 2 verse 7 says that Christian ministers are to be a pattern or example of good works. Chapter 3 verse 1 says that the saints are to be quote 
ready to every good work. We must be that beloved. In chapter 3, verse 8, teaches that we must be careful to maintain good works because we can grow careless and remiss. If you look at chapter 3, verse 14, the penultimate verse, it reads, And let ours, that is, people in the church, God's saints, let ours also learn to maintain good works for necessary uses, otherwise we become unfruitful. Titus had a lot to say about the necessity and value of good works. And I haven't mentioned one particular one, I'll say that now. Titus 2 verse 14, the one we're going to focus on in connection with Lord's Day 32, says that Jesus Christ gave himself for us with this purpose, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Are we zealous of good works? Are we as a church zealous of good works? Now our Heidelberg Catechism, this is representative of the biblical and the form faith too, <coughs> greatly emphasizes and inculcates the importance of good works. If we were to skip ahead a little in our Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 91 explains the nature of good works. What are they? That question and answer tells us that the standard of good works is the law of God. Not necessarily what society or the world thinks, not usually, not often, what the world thinks, but what God says, that's the standard, is law, some in the Ten Commandments. The source of good works is faith, and out of that source alone can good works come. Faith, of course, wrought by the Holy Spirit. And the goal of good works is the glory of the triune God. Now, Lord's Day 32, which we read earlier, explains the origin of our power to do good works. Christ redeemed us by his blood, and the Holy Spirit renews us after Christ's <coughs> image so that we can do good works. That same question and answer gives us four purposes of good works. We do good works to show our gratitude to God, to praise the Lord. We do good works also so that our assurance of God's love and salvation of us may deepen. And then there's an evangelistic purpose of good works that others through our godly living are converted to Jesus Christ. Let me read question and answer 86 to you again. <coughs> Listening out now for the two full origin of our good works and the four purposes given. Since we're delivered merely of grace through Christ without any merit, why must we do good works if it's not to earn salvation? Answer. Number one, Christ having redeemed us by his blood also, number two, renews us by his Holy Spirit after his own image. And then come four aspects of the purpose of these good works. Number one, so that we may testify by the whole of our conduct, our gratitude to God for his mercies. And then number two, that he may be praised by us. And number three, also that everyone may be assured in himself of his faith by the fruits of love. And then number four, that by our godly conversation others may be gained to Christ. Since we, as Christians, by definition, according to the Spirit of Christ which is in us, since we want to show gratitude to God, that we are thankful for what He's done for us, and since we want to praise Him, and since, too, we want to grow in our assurance of our salvation, 
And since we want to see others, friends, family, workmates, whoever it may be, want to Jesus Christ, then our calling is to live a life of good works and even to be zealous of good works. That's our theme this morning, beloved. <clears throat> Zealous of good works. The meaning of it, the source of it, and the preaching of it. The meaning, the source, and the preaching of this zeal for good works. What are good works then? Well, to rework. Question and answer 91, we could say that good works are deeds performed according to the law of God, out of faith, and to the glory of the triune God. I repeat that. Good works are deeds performed according to God's law, out of true faith, and to God's glory. Good works are Righteous works, deeds which are in keeping with the Ten Commandments, activities which evince the love of God and the neighbour. You could say that good works are deeds which flow from the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy, and peace, and long suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Or you could say that good works are driven by the three Christian virtues, the cardinal ones, of faith, and hope, and love. Now Titus chapter 2, it especially in this epistle, speaks of various good works and the virtues which issue in good works with respect to various members of the church. In verse 2, for instance, the aged men are called to be sober. It's the main grace spoken of in this chapter. It keeps being mentioned, sober. Sensible, solid, not frivolous or blown about with every wind of doctrine, thinking soberly. Gravity, temperance, self-control, soundness in the faith and in love and in patience. Verse 3 calls upon the aged women to be holy, dedicated to the Lord's service, so that they're not slanderers or drunkards. And the, old, the older women are called to teach the younger women, and to teach the younger women to be sober, that word again. They teach the younger women to love, especially two groups of people, their own husbands, not somebody else's husbands, and their own children. And they teach them too to be obedient to their husbands and to be keepers at home, homemakers, and various other qualities. This passage teaches us that part of good works is that the older women with wisdom and grace and humility teach the younger women, and that the younger women subject themselves in a sense too to the teaching of the older women. This is good news for the minister because the minister finds it harder to instruct women, more delicate matter too, and that that is to be done especially in practicalities by the women themselves. There are things you know about leaving a home and caring for your children from your perspective as an older woman that are much more useful to the younger woman than what I, as a man, could even teach. Then if you move to verse 6, the good works of young men start also with being sober-minded. And then the minister is to be an example to all, but here particularly to the younger men, a pattern of good works so that his doctrine is with integrity and reverence and incorruptibility. And that the minister uses sound speech so that those who dislike what he says don't have anything evil to say about him, so that he adorns the doctrine even by proper diction and pronunciation, for example. The servants, slaves, employees, must obey their own masters, they don't have to obey anybody else's master, and they must please them, they don't answer back, 
they don't pilfer and steal, but they're faithful. And that way they adorn the doctrine of God. Good works, very practical for males, females, employees, husbands, wives, older people, younger people. If you look at chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, here we have the good works of the elders presented in terms of their qualification for office, which applies, of course, both the teaching and ruling offices. Blamelessness is the key word in verses 6 and 7. Their responsibility to their wives, one wife, men, the care of their children, verses 6. And then they must also be not self-willed, not angry, not given to wine, not given to filthy lucre, so they're not controlled by money, drink, sober, hold fast the word of God, so that they can exhort and teach others to stray. And then if you move to chapter 3, all Christians are told to be subject to the principalities and powers, not here, angels, as is usually the case of those terms, especially when they're grouped together, but here, the civil magistrate. So they do good works, they don't go around slandering, speaking evil of people, they don't brawl or fight, they don't take part in riots, for instance, but they're gentle and meek. Now those are some of the examples of virtues and good works set forth in Titus, and you could add to that from the Word of God and many others. Children must honor, obey, and help their parents. Husbands are called to love their wives. We must all keep the Lord's Day holy, private, public worship. We must witness of Jesus Christ, the rose in God brings across our pathway. And many other things, so that we confess to the psalmist that God's commandments are exceeding broad. In fact, this isn't an overstatement either, all of our lives are to consist of good works. Because Jesus Christ is Lord, we're always to obey Him. The obedience of Christ, that's a good work. Good works are to characterize us, therefore, when we're at school, at home, church and when we're working and when we're resting in all our deeds. This passage, Titus 2, 14, calls us not merely to do good works but to be zealous of and for good works. And zeal, zeal speaks of ardor and fervency so that we're dedicated and even enthusiastic about good works. You say enthusiastic about good works? Well, of course, we're to be enthusiastic about serving Jesus Christ, and serving Jesus Christ is doing good works. So there's a zeal here, there's a burning zeal for Christ, which means for good works, so that we embrace and pursue and engage in obedience, serving the Lord, good works. And if this characterizes us, and must do more and more, then we are to look out for occasions of doing good. We're to do it repeatedly, continually, and without growing weary of well doing. And in fact, chapter 3, verse 8 says, We are to be careful to maintain them so that we don't fall away from doing good works, become slack in it. And we are indeed even to provoke others onto good works. That's the calling of all of us as Christians. This truth that all the children of God are to be engaged fervently in good works must be underscored. It would be wrong if any were to think, well, I'm not an office bearer, so there isn't much obligation on me to do much in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Well, chapter 2 verse 14 says that Christ gave himself for us 
that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. And anybody who confesses that Jesus Christ died for them must be zealous for good works. And if you say, well, I'm too old. Ah, Titus 2 says, the aged men, verse 2, must be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith. That's not a big step to call those things the virtues of good works. And similarly with the aged women now, undoubtedly we get older, maybe to your health fields, there are certain good works that you just can't do. Of course the Lord knows that. <coughs> But you can still be zealous in doing the good works that are still possible for you. And if you say, well, I'm a young person, I don't have to do much in the way of good works. Oh, you do, though. Oh, you do. Of course you do. Jesus Christ is Lord, Lord of the young people, too. That's what baptism is about, even for our common seed, amongst other things. Chapter 2, verse 4 says, the young women are to love their husbands and their children and be discreet. And the young men likewise must be sober-minded. Not even the children. And those who are small in stature and few in years also have, if they belong to Jesus Christ, they have the Holy Spirit. They know the Ten Commandments which summarize God's calling placed upon all of us. And we all must obey the Lord Jesus who bought us with his blood. All of us are called to be a good witness, to follow Jesus Christ wherever he goes, in our friendships, our schoolwork, our dress, and speech, zealous. In fact, no one, that's especially the point of Titus chapter 2, no one can derive a reason for not living a godly Christian life, zealous of good works. You can't argue on the basis of age or gender or job, all, all here, to be zealous of good works. According to chapter 2, verse 14 of Titus, those who are zealous of good works are called a peculiar people. A peculiar people. Now, in the 21st century, the phrase peculiar people you might think it means that Christians are supposed to be quirky or odd. Thankfully, this Word of God does not call us to be eccentric. There is no virtue in being an oddball or a weirdo. That's not your calling as a Christian. God's peculiar people here, and this phrase is used elsewhere in the Bible, means that we are God's special possession, distinctively and peculiarly His, because we're elect and redeemed and called. It means that we are God's particular, special, beloved people, as opposed to the wicked and unbelieving world. And the Bible highlights us, highlights this, by calling us, for example, God's treasure, His inheritance, his jewels, his delight, and the apple of his eye. And if you ask what makes us God's special, distinctive, peculiar, particular people, well, Deuteronomy 7, which we read at the start of this service, says it's God's eternal discriminating election. I loved you because I loved you means God's sovereign will explains his sovereign choice of us. The ultimate reason resides in God's own will. Discriminating love, discriminating redemption. This text in Titus 2 verse 14 teaches us an additional truth that we in the world stand out as God's peculiar, that is, distinctive people, because God works good works in us. That's how we reveal to others that we are a peculiar, distinctive, particular people.
according to God's election or redemption, we do good works. We show we're God's treasure by doing good works. That's the point too of the second half of the second chapter of James. So our good works then don't merit our being part of God's distinctive people. Our good works show and prove that we are a part of God's people. These good works are specifically Christian good works done according to what the Bible teaches, not according to the passing fads of the ungodly, today called political correctness. Obeying those laws, that's not the point, it's obeying God's word. These, words are, these good works too are done according to the glory of the triune God, not merely for some vague conception like the good of humanity. No, God sent it. These good works are done too out of the power of the crucified and risen Jesus Christ and by his Holy Spirit. They're not done out of mere moral, earthly, humanitarian considerations. They're done because the Spirit of Christ works them in us. These are the works that mark the saints out as God's peculiar people. And the word used for good works in Titus 2.14 indicates that these good works are beautiful. That's the connotation here. Beautiful to God. And therefore to saints who think God's thoughts after him. God sees beauty, attractiveness, goodness and excellency in the good works of his saints. And God is attracted to those good works that he works in us. And he declares, these people are my people. They honor me. My spirit is working virtues in them that I like and enjoy. This means that we, as a church of Jesus Christ, must be manifest not only to God, but also to man as a body of God's own distinctive, special people by being zealous of good works. This means that we must not only be distinctive in our doctrine, and as a Christian who believes the Bible, especially as that's summed faithfully in our three forms of unity, we've got to be distinctive, but we must also be distinctive in our godly Christian living so that both go together. That's the point too of Titus chapter 2 verse 1. Speak thou the things which become are proper and fitting for sound doctrine. Speak the things, the calling of the believer now to do those works, which are in perfect harmony with biblical truth. You see the same thing at the end of Titus 2 verse 10. The Servants and employees, and this extends to all classes and groups of Christians, must do good works, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour in all things. So that our lives are to make attractive and beautiful the doctrines which we teach and believe and hold dear. This means that if we are only distinctive in Scripture on the form doctrine, this indicates that there's something wrong, not with our doctrine, but something wrong with us. We adorn it so that people can say they don't make their doctrine ugly by the way they live and behave, but they make it attractive. There's something there that's appealing and winsome by the way they live. That gives us a good witness and a good reputation in our area. That also God uses to attract people to the truth and not repel or repulse them. And this serves evangelism as answer 86 puts it, that by our godly conversation others may be gained to Christ. This is the sort of thing too, I'd imagine, which is going to be dealt with more fully at the BRF conference this summer. 
some of us here who are going well, here. And when I speak about adorning this doctrine by our lives, you'll understand that the purpose is not to make us proud or anything like that, because that's repulsive too, because we don't boast in ourselves, and we don't say that we made ourselves to differ. Now if we turn now to the source of these good works, you understand that the flesh can't produce them. <coughs> you understand too that we didn't make ourselves God's chosen people. We can't even purify our own heart. We're not sufficient of ourselves even to think anything good of ourselves, Paul tells the Corinthians. And we don't have any ability whatsoever to obey God's law because in us, we hate the law of God and we hate God. Titus 2.14 says that Jesus Christ gave himself for us so that, here's his purpose, he may redeem us <coughs> and purify unto himself a peculiar, distinctive people, zealous of all good works. Christ redeemed us, delivered us by his blood, says the Heidelberg Catechism, and renews us by his own spirit, according to his own image, so that we may do good works. This establishes, of course, this inseparable connection between Christ's redemption and our doing good works. It's impossible for anybody for whom Jesus Christ shed his blood not to do good works. Those who don't do good works, Jesus did not die for them. That simple. The source of our good works lies, first of all, in God's eternal election of us, because God ordained before the foundation of the world each and every good work of each and every Christian, so that we should walk in them. And I didn't make that up or deduce that from biblical premises, though it would be a valid deduction. That's the express teaching of Ephesians 2, verse 10. The Holy Spirit then enters us, renews our wills, and enables us to obey God's law, not perfectly, but truly. And it all proceeds to us from that cross of Jesus Christ. Christ. Here's how it goes then. God eternally foreordains all the good works of all the elect for each and every day. Including you are coming here by the Spirit to hear and believe God's word. Then at the cross, Jesus died for our sins and amongst other spiritual benefits, he obtains the Holy Spirit to empower us to do good works. And then that same Spirit, day and daily, works our good works in us. Which means that when every true Christian does a good work by God's grace, it is because 2,000 years ago in another part of this world, the Son of God died at Calvary. That's it. And then, by the way you live, you say, in effect, Jesus Christ died for me. Which means you testify that his death is efficacious and powerful and irresistible and transforming and particular. Because I, by the grace of God, do good works, whereas others who don't believe in him don't do good works. Which shows us, too, the lie of Arminianism once again. Because Arminianism teaches that Jesus Christ died for everybody. But look at verse 14 of Titus 2. Christ gave himself for us. And the us, of course, are the people of God. Not everybody had for him. And the Christ giving himself for us has this purpose. That he redeems us from all iniquity. And most people aren't redeemed from iniquity. So Christ didn't die for them. And this purpose, that he purifies unto himself a distinctive, particular people. The people who are zealous of good works, and most people aren't, which shows that Jesus Christ did not die for them because the purpose of his death is to create in those for whom he died good works. This means that when the Christian falls into sin and walks in evil works rather than good works, his lifestyle betrays and contradicts this confession of the gospel. This means that we profess that Jesus died for us, that his death is a transforming power, 
But then, by our evil works, we deny it. And of course, if a person does not do good works at all, and dies in this state, we can only conclude that Jesus Christ did not die to redeem him, because if he did redeem him, he would have done good works. Question answer 87 says, Cannot they be saved who continuing in their wicked and ungrateful lives are not converted to God? By no means. The scripture declares that people who are unchaste, idolatrous, adulterers, thieves, covetous, drunkards, slanderers, robbers, and such like, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. The scripture says to such people, then you must repent and believe in Jesus Christ or you perish everlasting. The lake of fire is the destiny of such a live that way. And Jesus Christ alone is the only way of forgiveness. And then, then you'll be able to do good works. And then you'll have assurance that you're a part of God's particular, distinctive people. This calling to be zealous of good works must be taught. In fact, that's what the book of Titus is all about. Paul here writes to Titus, who at this stage is working in Crete, in the eastern Mediterranean, and he says, Now Titus, you know your calling as an evangelist, and by extension now a preacher of the gospel, and I'm going to tell you this is your calling, especially in Crete, because Crete's a bit dodgy. You must... Preach good works, especially there. Chapter 2, verse 15. These things speak, these things about good works and the various types of people. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. These good works, therefore, must be taught by you in various ways. These things speak. Verse 15 begins. Speak as a general, broad term. You must speak these things, Titus, in your preaching. You must preach the necessity of good works in your worship services. Our Heidelberg Catechism lays that upon us in Lord's Day 32 and elsewhere. This is also taught too as we sing the Psalms. Because as Colossians and Ephesians tell us, we teach and admonish one another. Not only do we sing to God, but as we sing, there's a horizontal aspect. We teach and admonish one another as we listen and think about what we're saying and what others are saying. We teach and admonish one another with these psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, including those we're singing this morning. The minister, too, must also speak about good works. It is counseling. <coughs> so that the same cross which grants us forgiveness grants us also the power to live a godly life. And this needs to be taught even to those who are straying who need admonition. And when it's unpopular, this is your Christian duty to do good works. This also takes place in private conversation where opportunity presents itself. And this is too part of family visitation, which is getting near in that part of the year. So that means that the minister's teaching does not simply present information. It does. It even does that first. Sometimes, given the text, it does that mainly. But it involves exhortation. These things speak and exhort. So the minister must not only say that good works are necessary, and they certainly are, but he must command that you and me do them. So that you feel encouraged and exhorted to do that. And this, this, as with other things, reproof is also necessary. These things speak and exhort and rebuke. So that when the child of God is doing evil works or omitting good works, the minister's office includes pointing this out with humility and trust calling us all to repentance and obedience. And you will understand too that this is a difficult calling for a minister and for elders too because the office bearers are sinners 
and nobody likes to risk offending other people. You understand this too, because sometimes it's your calling to admonish others and you find that difficult, and it certainly is. And it's also unpalatable for us to hear admonitions and abuse. And we instinctively, we all do this, it's our first reaction, we instinctively say, well, who's he to be telling me what to do? He's far too young, the older people may say. Titus here is probably not that old. He's exhorted to be a good example to the young men in chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And scripture exhorts Titus and all ministers to exhort aged men and aged women. And the last part of chapter 2 even says, Let no man despise thee, whether you're older than them or younger than them, because to the old person, the ministers to the young, we'll need to listen to them. To the young person, the ministers to the old, we'll heal with us, we'll have to listen to them. And you can always work out an excuse for not doing what the Word of God says if you think hard enough. And because we're depraved of ourselves, we do think about such things. Age is never the issue. Although age and maturity may help the minister and make it easier to listen to what he says, if he's your age, fair enough. But age isn't the issue. It's office. Do we believe that Jesus Christ speaks through his word, through the offices that he has appointed? Do we believe that Christ is represented by his representatives? That's the issue. That's the issue. And if the young people say, well, what would he know? He's not a teenager anymore. I don't have to listen to him. He doesn't know my struggles. That's true enough. You don't have to listen to me, as I am. But you do have to listen to Jesus Christ, who speaks through his office bearers. So you do have to listen. And the minister is told to speak and exhort and rebuke, verse 15 says, with all authority. With all authority. That authority, of course, is if he, if he speaks according to the word of God, if he doesn't speak according to the word of God, he has zero authority, and you better not listen to him. And that all authority, too, is the authority of Jesus Christ himself, who's the incarnate Son of God. All the authority of Christ. And he who hears you, hears me. And he who doesn't hear you, doesn't hear me. That's authority. The minister doesn't have to shout and lower the roof off, but you just believe that's authority. If the scripture is rightly explained and applied. Hard to believe, because it's just a man. But God says so in his word. But in connection with this, the minister who exhorts us to good works must not allow himself to be disguised for any reason or by anybody, no matter what status or what academic qualifications the minister has or doesn't have or the despiser has or doesn't have. That's verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. The word despised here is intriguing because it carries the idea of thinking around or bypassing. And you can immediately see what this word of God is getting at. Let no man in your exhortations, and in your exhortations to good works, that's the context of Titus chapter 2, bypass you or think around your biblical exhortation and reproof and teaching. And this is added at the end of all of these exhortations to good works because the people of God, being sinful, Sheep too are immediately tempted to do this. You are. I am. That's us. That's our nature, just fallen. <coughs> We're immediately tempted to despise. How can I get out of that? It's like a new tax law. New tax law goes in. What is the businessman thing? Where are the loopholes? How can I get around paying taxes? Well, God brings His word and we immediately, how can I get around that? Is there any way out? That's how we operate. But if a minister or an elder, as Christ's representative, bringing God's word, not their own, is bypassed by you, then you're in sin. Then you're headed for disaster. There is only one way down. And in this passage, you see, thinking around or bypassing the biblical 
teaching of office bearers, especially here in the preaching, means you will necessarily decrease in good works. That's the context. And when you decrease in good works, you increase in something else. Bad works. You will decrease in good works and increase in bad works. And then, as chapter 2, 12 and 13 puts it, you'll find it harder to deny ungodliness. You'll struggle to oppose your worldly lusts. It'll become more difficult to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world or age. <coughs> Creation and fall to the end of the world, this world is under sin. And it'll be a struggle and you will think much less of the blessed hope of the glorious coming of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ. Verse 13 here teaches our great God and our Saviour is Christ. He's not only our Saviour, he's our great God. And then these four purposes in answer to 86. Gratitude through good works. You'll not be as grateful. Praising God, you'll not think much about it. It'll be wearisome to you. Your assurance will win, as it does. Confidence that you're a child of God, that he loves you. It will win, it always does. That's how God works. And we will not even give a hoot about the conversion of others. But on the other hand, and this is the main point of Titus 2, in the way of heeding the authoritative speaking, exhorting and rebuking, particularly now about good works, we will become more and more zealous of good works. The power to do good works comes to us through the cross of Jesus. As the Karens put it, this power is conferred on us by means of admonitions. So let's heed this authoritative, exhortative word and be zealous of good works, showing ourselves to be a special people and love him who gave himself for us that we might do them.